right hand side, you've got a guy, a guy called um, Iverson S. McCadda. Now he was the founder of the British National Union of Students, um, which initially only covered England and Wales. Uh, he was a Scottish person, but he founded that um, organization. He was the first president, but particularly he was involved in international initiatives, um, as we will see. Um, but one thing to remember about some of the international initiatives was that um, the governments of all the countries that we as students come from are sometimes very interested in these international initiatives and what's going on at them. Um, and as you see, that sort of interference or backdoor interference um, is quite interesting. So McAdam was very much seen as a safe pair of hands to guide the initial British and US. Um, in one direction, um, and our organization took a very different direction in the 1930s, when, particularly in response to the rise of fascism. Um, and just for fun, just for fun, I've included a picture of myself over the other side. This is me in 1980. Um, as a student, I'm about to embark on being a vice president of my student union at Lancaster. Uh, just to show that, and I suppose it's another caveat, really, a thing to, you know, when, when I'm talking about things, remember, I've lived through a lot of this for the last 40 odd years of the student movement's history. So if I have biases or I get some things wrong, it's partially because I've lived through it and sometimes you don't always see everything. Um, and the other apology I'll make initially is that a lot of the players initially are men, they're generally white, um, but that changes over time. And if you look at some of the early pictures of NUS UK's involvement and their activism, there's a lot of white men in the room. But as you can see, this is a picture taken in 2015, I think, of our executive committee. And as you can see, it's a lot more diverse and a lot more representative of students who are now living um, in the UK. But that has taken work and that has taken commitment. And, and, and so that, that's one of the things that's the really exciting thing about the student movement. So I'm gonna divide the session up today into four bits. The first bit, we're going to look at the development of international student organizations really up until 1939, what went on then. Um, we'll then look at the, the collapse of those organizations and then the recreation of them after the war, from, really from 1940 onwards up until about 1970, well, which I mean, apply all African Student Union, um, ESSU, and so on, and Commonwealth Students Association. Um, and for each part, there'll, there'll be a very short bit at the end where we can um, have a quick chat against each section. And then right at the end, we're going to have a, a, a lot of discussion. Hopefully, uh, you, you, you'll have a chance to bring some of your historical knowledge uh, to bear uh, for everybody else who's taking part in, in this. Um, and I suppose the key thing about the international is that there is not just a student movement, there are several student movements, there are many student movements. Some movements are formal and organized, as Manuel was saying, and others just arise to deal with an issue, particularly an issue of injustice um, that may arise at any one point. And that can spread. So if we take uh, the initial slide I showed you, um, had the Fees Must Fall campaign that um, emerged in South Africa. Uh, which evolved from the Rhodes Must Fall campaign. But equally, I know um, those campaigns were inspirational to British students who then took on the Rhodes Must Fall um, campaign within their own campuses and their own institutions. And that has been a catalyst for a whole discussion about decolonizing education uh, and, and changing the way, way in which people learn and what people learn um, in my own country. So it's that interplay between what happens in one country and that solidarity um, of students in another country can have a really um, profound impact. So let's start with early student organizations. I don't know if anyone's got a quick way of moving slides on. <laughs> there we go. So here we are. So we're gonna look at the development of international student organizations up until 1939. Here is um, two initial ones. So on the left-hand side, you've got a picture of Lund University in Sweden. And in 1842, um, they decided to organize international conference and they invited students from all over the world, but generally it was the only people who made it were students from um, European countries. Um, and I don't know any more about that. So any colleagues from Sweden who may be present in, in this talk or anything else, if you do know what happened at that conference, it's quite interesting. It's, it's often referred to, um, certainly in our own histories, but no one quite knows what happened at it, other than it was an international student conference. Perhaps more significant was this other one, where you see that group of men in, in hats and so on there. That's, a, that's an organization called Corps de Fratres, um, or the International Federation of Students. And this was set up in Turin in 1898. 
And it came from um, groups of um, organizations called festive and carnival societies. So again, in European universities, particularly the really old ones, uh, there were societies that dedicated to creating carnivals and fun events for the local town and everything else, and maybe involved in fundraising as well. So this is where this came from. It had a, the first president was a guy called Fitzio Giliotas from Turin, um, but it was a very male organization, as you can see. There was one female delegate at the very first conference who was from Rome, Emilia Santa Maria, but she was the only one, and of course she was the secretary. So as you can see, things were um, not exactly um, diverse at this point. However, it spread beyond um, the borders of Italy. It covered um, Australia, Brazil, Egypt, Chile, Malta, India, China, and the United States. Um, and there were particularly strong links actually with the United States who, 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 who quite like a club, really. And they organized events that brought, together, that, that, that brought students together in all sorts of different things, including a World International Student Conference, which took place in Pittsburgh um, in 1913. Now, Corda Fratres's um, objectives were friendship and mutual understanding among students of the world. Okay, and the aims were to deal with matters of general interest to students, interestingly, except political or religious matters, um, to provide members with intellectual and material advantages, whatever that meant, to facilitate training and stays abroad, uh, to promote the establishment of languages and literature for students during holidays, so promoting intercultural exchange, to promote congresses, meetings, and international celebrations amongst students, and to promote excursions and all kinds of sports. And quite a lot of the international student sporting organizations that emerge at this time um, emerge from these initiatives. You know, where there's a lot of natural alliance, I guess, between sporting people wanting to compete against each other and have international games. So a lot of that um, comes from this period of time. Um, but as you can see, those objectives are pretty similar to a lot of objectives uh, organizations uh, today have. Um, however, immediately, um, there was tensions within the organization. First of all, there was tension between Italy and France about leadership of the organization. There was a lot of clashes there. There was also a sort of internal tension among, amongst Jewish students who were, who were members of the organization, but then they were divided along pro and anti-Zionist lines, and that was an interesting discussion, but that discussion spilled out and caused tensions um, at the conferences themselves. I don't, for, don't forget the leaders of the organization didn't want politics and religion to come in, but of course, politics and religion immediately um, entered the door. Um, some of the other early student organizations that I've come across have been based on religion, Pax Romana, for example, and the World Student Christian Fellowship. Um, there are others that are based around academic discipline or sporting discipline. And usually some of these smaller international bodies have um, really got a, a sense of like-mindedness about them and, and, the, and the funding is quite obvious. However, creating a student body that has advocacy a part of its role is a lot more difficult. Yeah, and there's some key questions um, when you're creating such an organization. And these are questions I know that the GSF and the people who had the vision to sit around and create the organization um, have been wrestling with is who is paying? You know, where's the money coming from? And if the money's coming from somewhere, what do the people who are giving you the money want? If anything, are there strings attached? Um, they're also looking at who is a legitimate representation, a representative from an organization from a country. Because um, some countries will have several unions or different uh, politically organized unions um, linked to political parties, for example. So who is the representative um, of that country? Also, what will be represent represented on behalf of whom are student representatives speaking? Um, so really, the, the, these issues of funding, legitimacy of the organization, the, the policy position on what is discussed, and also ultimately the independence of the organization, the autonomy of the organization. Are they free to criticize their, their home government or not? Or are they acting on behalf of their home government? And these issues uh, come up all the time in the history of international student organizations. Um, and certainly I, I would take the view we have to be very careful about this and understand where people are coming from if we're trying to create an independent and credible student voice at an international um, level. Now, all of this work that I've been talking about here was paused, um, obviously, with the outbreak of the 1914-1918 um, war. Um, so the war had a dev devastating effect on communities right across the world. Um, there was 9 to 11 million um, military personnel um, killed in the war, um, but also 16 to 13 million um, people killed who were civilians. 
Um, and some of that was during the war, and some of that was in the immediate aftermath of the war, um, with some communities taking revenge, for want of a better word, on other communities as a consequence of the tensions that had arisen um, during the war. These, these pictures here are not of students. I didn't, I didn't really have a picture of students at war. So this is my, um, my, my great uncle Clifford, who was in a, a tank regiment um, during the war. And there he is with some of his guys in the army of occupation in Cologne in 1919, plus a picture of him wandering about on his tank up there. But you know, a, a truly frightening experience. And it had a massive impact, particularly in the universities where people were very conscious of the loss of um, fellow academics and students and everything else um, that was happening there. Um, so a lot of those students, when they went home, um, they were very committed to organizations that promoted peace. And so they founded organizations committed to peace, relief work, because uh, a number of uh, regions of Europe have been utterly devastated. There was a fundraising effort on the part of Chinese students, for example, to help students in Austria um, buy books and to get back on track in terms of some of the academic work they were wanting um, to do. Um, and a lot of these wanted to talk to each other so that they could learn and ultimately avert another such war um, uh, taking place. Um, so the initiative to create a student international, which was one of many, many, many um, initiatives on the part of students and other people to bring about greater global links and peace and solidarity and understanding. So we come up now to the, I think called the Confederation Internationale des Etudiants. Um, so this is the first, well, second really um, attempt after Corte Fratres uh, to create a glo truly global student um, international. The initiative was started um, by UNEF, the French, uh, one of the French national unions at that time. They'd been founded in, I think, 1907. So this is in 1919. And they call a meeting at Strasbourg. And, and calling a meeting at Strasbourg is significant because Strasbourg has become French again, having previously been part of German territory. Um, they, so they call this international meeting. So about 17 formal NUSs go, but also a lot of individual students go from all across Europe. It is largely, it's meant to be international, but it is largely um, consists of uh, European students. And it's anticipated that delegates to the meetings would be the future leaders, if you will, of their respective uh, countries. Because don't forget higher education at this point um, is not, uh, is not, has not achieved a massification. It is quite narrow and there's, you know, establishments and people from the establishments are educating their own people to continue to run the countries. So, um, but it was seen as really important that these um, future leaders got to know each, each other. Interestingly, at these early meetings, Corda Fratres used to attend and say, look, you don't need to create an international student organization because we've already got one. See, we, we but anyway, they got ignored and the CIA became the, the main vehicle. Um, so at the first meeting, the, the, the picture you can see there is at the second meeting. This, this took place in 1923, 1924, so around about that time. I think it's 1924, and this is at Oxford, but you've got the um, international student representatives there, um, all um, part of the uh, discussions. The delegates agreed a constitution, and, and it confirmed that the membership of the CIE would be national unions yeah, from countries. So they would meet regularly, and it, but they wanted to ensure that there was a regular contact between students and thinkers. And the objectives were there was the coordination of intellectual activity, the study of issues relating to higher education, and plans to contribute towards the broadening of cultural understanding, which included in particular travel and exchange um, of students. And again, all of this was meant to be carried out independent of any political or religious view. Uh, sec a secretariat was formed with a headquarters in Brussels, which was staffed by volunteers, who worked through a series of commissions that dealt with different aspects of the work. One of them, for example, was the Travel Commission, which looked after all the, all the student travel that was being developed at that time. And that was run by um, um, a woman uh, who I'll introduce you to um, in a minute. However, it's no doubt that the students who gathered in Strasbourg in 1919 were moved by a spirit of idealism and wanting to come together, but it was very quickly dented in a series of disputes um, over membership. Um, for example, the French delegates were really reluctant to admit the former enemy, if you like, um, Germany, Hungary, Austria, and Turkey. And they were, they were refused membership until such time as they got membership of the League of Nations. And quite often the CIE was referred to as a mini League of Nations as well. 
the Norwegian and Swedish national bodies were inclined to include everybody, and, and they made the case strongly at the very first Congress in Prague in 1921. And it was they who persuaded English delegates to get involved as a counterweight to what they saw as French influence. But already you can see there is a political divide, even though they say they don't do politics, there is a political divide emerging um, within that movement. But interestingly, the to be represented at this body, the Confederation, um, was the catalyst for the British students to set up what is now NUS UK, so that, that they were established in 1922. Um, similar story in Sweden, they were founded in 1921. Um, so again, it was to be represented at these um, bodies. Now the uh, exclusion of the Union, which is the Deutsche Studentenschaft, was not exclusively because they were the enemy or the former enemy. It was also because um, they had a pan-German mission, so they claimed to represent all Germans, no matter where they were. And that kind of rubbed up against the um, national model that the CIE was trying to produce. Um, for example, Scotland and England at this point had separate national unions, and that, that, that was a problem uh, for membership as well, which was eventually solved, but it was still a problem. Um, and, for, and Spain and Belgium, for example, were very vocal in opposing any other national union from their territories um, gaining membership. Um, of the organization. So once again, tensions over membership um, are a really big thing in terms of development of, of these organizations. Um, one of the main objectives, certainly from a lot of the uh, Nordic countries, if you will, were what they called practical activities. Okay, so you've, you've got various examples of the practical activities here. You've got an Anglo-German rucksack songbook. This was a book that was taken on holidays by Germanic and English um, students who would go hiking together and sing songs together and not fight each other. I and mean, that was kind of the, the thinking behind that. There were special tours organized in, in particularly in Germany and Hungary and places like this, but these tours eventually became global. There was international correspondence exchange where students were encouraged to write to each other or to exchange um, families with each other. You know, one, one student would go and stay with one family and their equivalent would go and stay with the, uh, the other host family. Um, so a lot of uh, practical activities to bring people together. The, the, the woman you can see in the picture there is a woman called May Hermes, and she was a leading figure in early international travel schemes. Um, so between 1917 and 1921, she studied French and German, and she undertook um, teacher training. And after she graduated, she worked for the normal, the, the newly created National Union of Students in, um, in England and Wales, initially as what they called correspondence secretary. And so she organized that correspondence exchange that I've just mentioned to you, but then as secretary of the travel department, and she worked not just for NUS, but also for the CIE. Um, so she traveled widely and she persuaded country after country after country, I and mean, she, she went everywhere to recognize the International Student Identity Entity Card. Now this is the um, ancestor, if you will, of today's International Student Identity Card. And the idea was that that card would allow you access as a student to all sorts of facilities, um, from each of the host countries, but they required individual treaties, if you will, <laughs> between the CIE and all the different um, countries that students were keen to travel to. Um, and she was always, uh, she was a very, very important advocate of internationalism, if you like. In 1931, she represented the CIE at the League of Nations International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation, for example. Um, and she was also a founding member of the British Federation of University Women and served as the secretary of the International Federation of University Women from 1941 to 56. So a very um, significant character there. So that's the CIE. There were other initiatives. Um, so the CIE was not the only one. Um, at the same time as the creation of the CIE, students in Mexico um, held an international um, student congress that consisted of about 23 NUSs from the Americas, from Asia, and from some European, European countries. I can't find out which countries attended this conference, um, and I've not found any evidence of further meetings. What is interesting, though, it was far more global than the CIE attempts, um, and, and you can look at the delegate, so that which countries were engaged in that. So it was a sort of broader continental reach, um, at the very least. Um, the universities were always keen themselves, universities were always keen to promote academic links through, and they had a series of student bureau that these individual student bureau organized travel and exchange and that sort of thing. Um, and they had a conference in Leipzig in 1922, and they tried to set up an alternative to um, the CIE, 
um, but delegates who were involved in the COA managed to get that stopped. But again, you see one organization coming up and then another one, another group of people thinking, oh, well, we could maybe do a better one. Um, this is very much a British um, initiative. So um, in US and England and Wales were instrumental in trying to create an imperial conference of students. So that was um, for the British Empire, um, as well as the time. It mainly seems to evolve what were called the Dominion. So um, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. They were the main ones that got involved and were there. And to be honest, the people who attended the conference, this initial conference in 1924, were mainly students from British Empire countries at that time. So, it, you know, kind of worked on that basis, but it wasn't really a truly representative conference. What it did do was initiate in some countries the willingness to set up a national union. And the idea of that was that they would then join the CIE. Um, so it was meant to be complementary. But again, regular contact fell at the financial hurdle uh, because getting people together, there was no money for it necessarily. And so it, um, the only two main outcomes of this Imperial Conference was a student athletic union where people played you know, games against each other and also an empire debating team which went around the empire um, debating issues. But really financial considerations put an end to the project. A second conference was planned in Montreal in 1928, but that didn't um, take place. So, and then the final initiative really before um, the end of this initial period is in 1934, we see the creation of a thing called the World Student Assembly. Now this is, um, this was mainly um, an initiative of the Soviet Union and it was part of what's called their popular front strategy. So trying to bring people together um, um, under, if you like, Soviet influence rather than any other influence. Um, but what was interesting was they managed to get number of students, they recruited student organizations from outside Europe. So in many ways, certainly um, the British um, NUS started to see that as a more representative body um, because it wasn't exclusively European um, in its approach. Now the CIA, um, as we say, well, we've already seen that there were troubles uh, within the CIE and they only get worse. Um, so there was a reluctance on the part of the members of the CIE to interfere with the internal politics of any member organization which on the face of it sounds fine, but in practical terms, it led to a great deal of um, discomfort, um, particularly when you got the rise of fascism and totalitarian governments during the 30s. And of course, some of those, those, right, the, that, those political developments in those countries had an impact on their student organizations. Um, so for example, um, in 1927, the CIA failed to condemn anti-Semitic um, incidents at a student conference in Oromia and Romania in, in, when the, um, you know, the student conference left the conference hall and went and um, committed outrages against local synagogues and the Jewish population. Um, this picture is courtesy of my colleague, Marius Diakon, who's from Romania, a good historian. Um, but that, you know, that's one of the things that really appalled certainly my own union and a number of other national unions who were members at the time about why it wasn't condemned and why people thought that was acceptable behavior. But of course, if you think about it, um, authoritarian governments are developing right across Europe at this point, and their student organizations are following them on the whole. Um, so some of them embrace that. Um, equally, a number of individual students um, got involved with the Spanish Civil War. Mostly, they got involved on the Republican side, but not exclusively. Um, certainly in Britain, there was a lot of fundraising um, for um, the Republicans uh, on the part of university students to try and um, do that. Um, there were similar initiatives um, and condemnations, for example, the Italian invasion of um, Abyssinia, Ethiopia at that time. Um, so there was um, there's a lot of change going on and people are looking around um, for alternative governments and alternative systems and so on. Um, and it, it's a very, very um, tense time. Um, so what we'll look at now, so in, in a sense, the, these initial things I've been um, discussing, if we, if we look at what some of the things that went right and some of the things that went wrong, um, the war intervened, of course, and put an end to a lot of the um, international um, work. Um, there were disputes in most of these organizations over membership or who was a legitimate representative. That was a very um, particular thing. Some of these disputes are around a national perspective. So who was seen as a legitimate representative of a country? Um, some of the national unions started to politically reflect their government and, and often saw their role 
and, and certainly I'd include my own union in this, as an extension of their country's diplomatic role or mission. Um, so they're not necessarily acting on behalf of the student voice, they're just acting on behalf of uh, country, if you like. Um, the lack of funds made it difficult to achieve any kind of global legitimacy, although the CIE recognized, uh, was recognized as an official legal body um, nation. Amongst the good things, I suppose, the CIE was the catalyst for the creation of a number of national unions that are still around uh, today. It was also seen as a good idea that was kind of badly implemented. So the idea was there. Um, and there was a lot of commitment to the idea of international student movement, but of course, um, now um, it ultimately failed because now we have another war. We have the second war and the um, implications of that. So I'm just going to stop for one moment to see if there's any questions about what I've talked about so far before we move on to part two. So as, um, Carmen, if you can, I can't see everybody, but hopefully you can. Um, yes, if anybody has got something to say, then please say I don't see any hands raised. So guys, if you have any questions or any comments, um, you can either raise your hand or jump in because I don't see anyone. Okay, Bismarck. I, I see Bismarck. Yes, Bismarck, go for it. Hi, please come in. Hi. Yes, we hear you. There is, of, there is a bit of noise. Yeah, it's good now. It's a little bit better, Basma. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Okay, so I I I joined not too long ago, but from the two comments, the two groups that you have discussed, um, the one that I listened to, I see the issue of uh, lack of funds uh, being raised. How fundamental was it? How fundamental was the lack of funds and what, what did it cause? How did it inhibit the activities? Um, well, they either meant the activities didn't happen or, or if they started, if there was an initial one, because quite often you'll get money to fund an initial idea, but then finding the recurrent funding to keep that going is very, very difficult sometimes. But the other problem, and we'll, we'll see this when we come to, to part two, to be honest, is that the funding comes with strings um you know who is funding you and why and what do they want from that so we'll see in the next phase broadly you have funding that is divided on cold war um lines and certainly the funding anticipates you will advocate as part of that battle in the, in the cold war which you can see or intellectual corporation or anything so I think that's the that's the impact. Uh, does that answer your question? Is that yeah? It's, it's okay. Yeah, I, I, I see a second one from Abu Bakr. Hello. Is there a second question there? Thought I saw one. Oh, maybe, maybe not then. Okay. Oh yeah. Are you there? It's it's me calling, <laughs> but I don't think. You can, I think you can continue. Okay, I'll, I'll carry on then. So the next phase, we're going to look at the, the period from 1940 to um, 1970. So whereas before there was a lot of emphasis on what they called intellectual cooperation, um, here um, there's a lot of emphasis on fascism, as you can imagine. This is the period where um, a number of unions embrace anti-colonialism and, and, and in many cases are fighting for their own liberation. Um, and there's a strong emphasis on peace, but peace on whose terms is part of the interesting element of it. Now, during the war, a number of um, exiles from different countries from all over the world were assembled in London. Partially they're waiting for D-Day, you know, they're gonna lead you know, troops and, and initiatives from their own countries and, and, and so on. Partially, they, they are exiled in London because they're stuck there because the war's broken out and they can't get home. Um, so very early on in the war, in 1941, an international student council was established that used to meet fairly regularly um, at Cambridge and invite any student who was then in the forces or exiled in Britain at, at any one point um, to meet and discuss what will they do after the war. Yeah. And so they produced a number of reports about rebuilding the world afterwards and what kind of hopes and aspirations um, they had. And they also made sure that their own 
organizations in different countries were thinking about these issues, if they could, of course. Um, now, one of the important things that the council did, um, that did, that is still with us today, is the creation of International Student Day, which I'm sure you all know about. Um, it came about because it was on this day in 1939 that the Nazis um, closed down the universities in Czechoslovakia um, and prescribed student organizations. I also executed um, student leaders and academics in the process. Now, that execution came from, um, there was an anti-occupation, um, anti-Nazi demonstration in Prague, and Jan Oplatel, who's the picture of the, of the young man there with the, the bow tie, um, actually wasn't on the demonstration. He was just, um, came out to have a look at it, and he was killed um, from a, a bullet from the authorities trying to, or well, the Nazi authorities trying to um, stop uh, the demonstration taking place. So his funeral, which you can see in the center there, became a massive political event. Everybody turned out, the injustice of it, the injustice of the invasion, everything else motivated them, you know, people in Prague to come out and show their solidarity and support for the family, but also for uh, against um, the Nazi occupation of their country. Um, that then led to um, a riot and violence and so on, and, and it was it was brutally suppressed, and this is where the executions um, took place. Um, so it was decided that the 17th of November, when this event took place, would become the International um, Student Day, uh, and it still is. Um, and it's not a day for, in, it's not an International Students Day, it's a day for students internationally, if that makes sense. Um, Another initiative that happened during the war was in 1902, uh, where there was a conference in Washington, which incredibly people managed to make it out to. And they created the International Student Assembly. It was just an assembly. It wasn't meant to be an organization. Um, and delegates came from all over the world, from the USSR, from China, Canada, Latin America. And a declaration was made that after the war, after victory, as they hoped, every effort would be made to establish a worldwide federation um, of students. And these moves, uh, were to lead to the establishment of the International Union of Students, which you all have heard of, I'm sure, which in the post-war years was, well, it was an inspiring thing, but it was also a source of disillusion for student activists. So it, 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 it causes um, some trouble <laughs> in there amongst the student world, if you like. However, the, so the foundations of the International um, Union of Students uh, was laid at two conferences in 1945. One took place in London, and the other one uh, was held in Prague. And what you'll notice during many, many of these um, talks is that Prague is often, you know, treated, it is literally in the center of Europe and it's often chosen as a place where a lot, particularly a lot of student meetings have take, taken place and a lot of development and, and so on. Um, and in fact, the headquarters of the IUS um, was in Prague as well, which I visited some years ago now. Um, so it led to this establishment so the um, the objective. So at, at the meeting in London, um, they started to organise a committee, and at the meeting in Prague, they agreed a constitution. The objectives of which were uh, to promote to my students an appreciation of the culture of war um, and democracy, uh, to give active support to all governments and social organisations which strive for peace and security, and to this end, to fight for the eradication of every message of fascist ideology and oppression from all educational institutions. And finally, to assist the students of colonial, semi-colonial and dependent countries in the struggle for freedom um, and independence. Um, and the first Congress took place from the 18th to the 31st of a house, and the whole conference took place in what was called the Oplatal Hostel, which was named after the murdered Czech student I referred to uh, in the last slide, and many of the conference meetings were held there. Um, and all those present uh, were certainly invited and united in their opposition to fascism. But as time went on within the organization, the definition of, the definition of who was or was not a fascist was to cause problems. At this stage, by far the majority of delegates were concerned to preserve some form of unity and not repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, the delegates from the USSR successfully change the agenda from the role of the student in modern society to peace and anti-fascism. And again, it was a difficult motion to oppose because who was not opposed to fascism and who was not, a, who was not striving for peace? Um, so the, initially, even with the foundation of IUS, there is starting to be a little bit of tension about what the, meet, what the organization is for and what it's there to do. Um, so, 
you know, you'll, you'll see some of the pictures here. I'll just introduce you to some of the personalities. Um, you've got a picture there as, as the, um, the group of people that is actually the British delegation. Um, and they're being demonstrated against. Interesting enough, this, this is at 1950. They're being demonstrated against because they, um, the other delegates believe that the British have initiated the Korean War, which isn't quite true, but you know, nonetheless, they're all surrounded by students chanting against them. So that, that's an early indication of some of the difficulties the organization had. Um, you've got some of their badges and their publications there. And then the, um, the individuals that had seen, the, the man on the top is a guy called Tom Madden. He was in the British Medical Association. So he was the first general secretary of the IUS. He'd um, fought with, I think, Yugoslav partisans during the war. And he made his way from Yugoslavia to Prague and um, very much looked after British interests there for a while. And the guy below is called Jojo uh, Groman, but I'll tell you more about him in a minute. But he's the first president um, of the IUS. Um, the, the IUS quickly established itself um, and was consulted by governments and was seen as the legitimate representative of students um, internationally. So the, the picture here shows um, IOS delegates. And you can see the really tall man on the left-hand side, that's Tom Madden, who was the first general secretary. Um, and here they are meeting the French Ministry of Education, for example. So, you know, there's a meeting with the French and everything else. So, and they, they duplicated this by traveling around and meeting with people and discussing the future of the world and, and um, reconstruction to the war. Um, there were also many practical activities. The publication you can see there is for the IUS International Stanatorium, which was at Trebatov in uh, Czechoslovakia. Um, at this time, um, and dying from tuberculosis, you may remember the picture of my great uncle um, right at the beginning of, of this presentation. Um, he died of tuberculosis when he was 22. His sister died when she was 32 of the same thing. Um, and so students who had contracted tuberculosis uh, were able to access this sanatorium where they could study, continue their studies whilst at the same time receiving uh, medical treatment. So that was one of the uh, sort of very positive things that the and practical things that the IUS did. They also organized, they, they had a, um, a magazine called World Student News. Um, it was published monthly, it was full color. It was very interesting. And actually for those of you studying particularly those of you studying liberation movements and anti-colonialism, it's a really rich source of um, direct experience from students writing from different parts of the world, um, articles in World Student News. Um, and they also organized World Student Games as well. So again, the World Student Games, which I think still exists, was um, carried on initially by the International Union of Students um, at this point. The IOS also, um, represent students on UNESCO's bodies, which um, as I think Manu referred to last week is a source of debate um, right at the moment. Now, most of the literature concerning this period is highly critical of students, certainly in my own country, the student that effectively was dominated and funded by um, the Soviet Union. Um, and this was the Soviet Union of Stalin, you know, of pogroms and show trials and so on. So, but however, I do think we need to be a little more understanding um, about delegates who are going there. Here's, here's a happy meeting of people in 1946. Um, they're from all different parts of um, the world. Um, and I think we, we, should, we need to think back what it was like. You know, you've just come through a war. There was an excitement in meeting people from different countries and a desire to come together and learn. And those of you who've gone to any of your you know, regional, um, you know, whether you meet to a meeting of OCLI or All African Student Union or ESSO or the CSA, it is quite exciting meeting people from different countries and just learning and exchanging information. Um, I mean, certainly at this point, the people in this picture may have, they may have, most of them probably will have served in the forces in one form or another. They may have, they may have been to prison. They may have been in a concentration camp or a gulag. They may have witnessed all sorts of atrocities that you hope no one will ever have to um, witness. So, you just have to imagine how you might feel um, at these first IUS congresses in Prague when you met people, some of whom you've perhaps been fighting only months before, you know. So, and as our president said when he came back from the meetings, if many of us, many of us had only just left a war, and most of us would have gone to any length to avoid another. Um, but anyway, what we're going to do now is take a look at what these um, conferences look like, because I've actually got some film uh, to show you. So let me just bear with me. Now, this first one is from the inaugural um, Congress in Prague in 1946. 
and what you're seeing are the the commentaries in Czech. So um, unless you speak Czech, then you'll have no idea what's happening. But I can tell you roughly what's happening in as much as this is the election of the uh, first president. So what you'll see is delegates discussing things and being organized for the vote. Um, then you'll see um, Tom Madden, who stood for president but lost to Yosha Groman, um, and you'll see him um, congratulating him at the end. So let's play the clip and then I'll talk about it. Congressus pracuje. Studenti z celého světa utvořili v Praze Mezinárodní studentský svaz. Jsme přítomní v volbě předsedy této organizace první toho druhu na světě. Volba ocenila statečný postoj československých studentů ve válce i jejich obětavou organizační práci poválečnou. Prvním předsedou vrcholné organizace studentů celého světa byl zvolen představitel československého studentstva Josef Groman. Blahopřejeme. Okay, so um... Now, Groman, who won the election there, uh, was widely respected. He, he'd survived the war in a German prison camp. Uh, um, he'd escaped and played a part in the uh, liberation of Prague um, at that time. And he became the president of the IES from its foundation until he was forced to resign in 1952. Um, and part of the reason he was forced to resign um, was that he was a, a Jewish student. And there was a purge at that time initiated initially by Stalin, but you know, exported to the Eastern Bloc generally um, against um, Jewish politicians in, in general. Um, what is also interesting, the leader of the, the, the Soviet Union delegation at this conference that you've just seen a little clip from, his next job is a guy called Shel Yepin, um, and his next job was head of the KGB. So, you know, there were quite heavy hitters, certainly from some countries, going along to these meetings. And what I also find really personal and very interesting is that when the, the Slansky purges were taking place in Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Shelepin got in touch with Groman and said, you need to get out of the country. So fascinating that the head of KGB would tip off an old student friend, if you like, um, about that. Anyway, um, Groman himself was um, eventually released in 1968 during what was known as the Prague Spring, which we'll come back to. Um, but then after that was crushed, he was back in prison and wasn't released again until the, um, the fall of the Berlin Wall. So he ended up being imprisoned by both fascists and communists and um, only eventually was able to contribute to the education system of his country um, when it changed um, after leaving the Warsaw Pact. We're going to have a look at another one, uh, another clip now. Oh, no, not that one. So this next one, I'm afraid, is a silent film, not because they made it silently. There's just no sound associated um, with it. But this is from the Prague Congress in 1950, and it shows more of the sort of the cultural surround of the event and what was happening. But it also shows you the scale and size. And this goes back to um, Bismarck's comment about funding. So this was funded. So as you can imagine, this cost quite a bit of money. There you go. That's the um, place for the Congress was taking place. That's in the street in Prague. As you can see, probably some Asian students there, I guess. That's the IUS headquarters. And in fact, that display was still there when I went there in 1992. And you'll notice some people are wearing strange hats. I believe these are called the uh, Falouch hats. Um, again, this goes back to old traditions, um, and it kind of shows how many, how experienced you are, how many conferences you've been to, and so on and so forth. Um, so very strange hats. We don't wear hats so much anymore at these meet at our meetings, but they certainly did then. So you can see, look at that. You know, that is all the elected officials there on top with all the flags. So that is quite a big operation. That's Tom Madden there talking to one of the delegates. That's the delegate hall. And then we get uh, pictures of different delegations.
And there's Groman speaking, Madden's, Madden's to his left there. As I say, apologies, we have no sound, but it, as I say, I wanted to give you an idea of the size and scale of these events. Okay. So, um, at that 1950 conference, uh, Congress, um, three problems led to the division of the student world. Um, first problem was the expulsion of the Yugoslav NUS, which was kind of on Stalin's orders, really. Um, they'd been thrown out of what was known as the Common Form, which is like the sort of um, cooperation group of the um, socialist countries at that time. Um, and Stalin was insistent that the Yugoslavs had to be thrown out. Now, interestingly, although some of the Western NUSs, if you like, um, really didn't like that. They didn't like that happening, even though they politically were different from the Yugoslav leadership. Um, but don't forget, a number of them had fought with the Yugoslav, Yugoslav partisans during the war. Um, so this caused a major bit of, a, of tension as much as that it was felt that the Yugoslavs had been thrown out um, on the orders of outside the student world, if you see what I mean. The other thing that happened, there was the coup in Czechoslovakia, in which a number of students have been imprisoned, for example. Um, and both of these led to, and so both of these incidents led many to believe that the IUS was not able to hold an independent line. And then the final thing, which I've already referred to, was the Korean War actually broke out during this conference. Um, and the news that reached Prague at that point um, was that the Americans and British had started it. And was, I think, I'm right in saying, it was the other way around. Either way, um, what was interesting was that there were lots of demonstrations against Western NUSs, if you like, quite a lot of hostility to them, um, and lots of condemnation um, from those um, platforms. So in many ways, it was not like, you know, these hopes and aspirations of the IUS are actually falling victim to Cold War divisions and tensions. Um, so obviously the USR, USSR were keen to fund international events to kind of spread their, you know, their thoughts, their ideas and their reputation, if you like. But by contrast, a lot of Western countries and then consequently their student unions took on a very sort of anti-communist um, line at this time. So we then get the creation of another organization called the International Students um, Conference. So, as you can see, some of these Western countries were increasingly dissatisfied with the approach and the dynamics at IUS meetings. And so in 1950, a meeting was organized by Olaf Palmer. Uh, you can see him there with the hat on in the middle of the picture there. And he's the future prime minister of Sweden. But at this point, he's, um, he's a student leader of the SFS. And he's discussing with other Western organizations the possibility of creating an organization that will focus on exchanging ideas and practical activities. So we're back to that whole thing of practical activities and not taking a, a political line. Um, he discussed this coming back from an IUS meeting in Bulgaria with various other um, Western leaders. And an initial conference was held in Stockholm. Um, the first formal conference took place in Edinburgh in 1952. A constitution was created and it was agreed to create a coordinated secretariat, which came to be known as COSEC. And the headquarters of the organization was to be in Leiden in the Netherlands. And the first second general secretary who's pictured there talking at the table was a guy called John um, Thompson. And they do very similar things to the um, IUS. They produce, um, they focus a lot on student travel. They produce a color magazine called The Student, which again is, is an interesting source of um, information about student life at the time. Um, very useful for researchers, I think. Um, they created a sort of educational program, a bit like what we're doing right now um, for different leaders from different countries. Um, but as with the IUS, it was immediately beset by disagreements over um, the purpose. So again, some of the Northern countries were more interested in no politics and what they call the students as such clause. And students as such mean you only discuss issues that relate to students as, as they are students, not only broader issues. Um, and certainly my own organization had that clause in, in its constitution at this time. Um, but obviously, a lot of the um, Southern American countries, the African countries, they're not interested in that. They don't want to talk about that. They, they want to talk about their anti-colonial struggles and liberation, and they want support um, from that. So the ISC, in effect, um, found itself taking a more political group, uh, route. Sorry, the, the conference in Copenhagen in 1953 uh, discussed issues of participation from countries from particularly Africa, Asia, and Southern America. Um, 
And their attendance, interesting, was made pos possible by provision of travel grants, a fund, if you will, from the Foundation for Youth and Student Affairs. Now we will come up, come across this foundation again in the, in, the, in the future of this talk and it's a decision actually they're gonna regret. Um, the students of such clause actually was then dropped around about this time because again, those who were struggling for liberation uh, required a wider scope of political uh, discussion to do that. Um, and so that happened within the ISC, but again, you still got these tensions about what are we discussing, why are we discussing it and who should be discussing it. The main activities program, as I said, there were um, exchange of um, students, there was travel, there were delegations to visit different countries, there was sharing of research, uh, promotion of student relief. Uh, the ISC was very instrumental in raising funds for Hungarian students who were exiled um, in 1956 when there was a sort of change of government there. Um, and they also support sporting and cultural activities. However, the ISC's refusal to sort of take a strong position, particularly on anti-colonialism, uh, was perceived as apathy or indeed um, by some as opposition. Um, and this tension in, eventually resulted in developing a declaration of human rights known as the Declaration of Lysin after the town in Switzerland where the conference was. And this led in the long term to the ISC actually dropping its students as such clause and taking on a more political, broader, um, um, view of discussion. Um, but again, there was problems looming on the horizon. This goes back to funding. Students were asking about the origins of some of the funds enjoyed by the ISC in particular. Um, so they were funded by an organization called the Federation of Youth and Student Affairs, which I've already referred to, and the Sanya Kinta Fund um, in the UK. There was a thing called the Atlas Fund, uh, which funded a lot of international activity. And they were rumored rumored to have um, State Department, American State Department um, connections, i.e. CIA backing. And other rumors suggested that some of the industrialists who donated money had connections with South Africa um, or were connected to companies and firms there. Now, before we move on to the resolution of that, um, here's just a few pictures of things happening at the ISC. We've got John Thompson there at the top um, addressing an ISC uh, meeting. The next picture along, um, you've got this is the COSEC table. These are the, um, the secretariat, if you will. The two men um, on the left-hand side are Jean Carrier and Jacques Garin of Canada. Now, the guy in the center, you've got um, Gwyn Morgan, who's the COSEC director. And then next to him is Jyoti Shankar Singh, who was his predecessor as director of uh, COSEC. Below, you've got the guys with um, headphones on their heads. Are, that's the United States NSA delegation at an ISC uh, meeting. Um, and then you've got also a group of um, guys there who are concerned about student travel and organizing student travel um, under the auspices um, of the ISC. Um, however, let's, let's move on to what, what happened next, if you like. So call this collapse and decline. In, in February 67, the ISC and, and the student organizations that were members of it were hit by a bit of a bombshell. Um, an American alternative magazine called Rampart, so you can see it's pictured there, uh, revealed that the United States National Students Association um, and the ISC and a number of other organizations worldwide um, that were student-led were receiving their funds through foundations and charitable bodies that actually were funded by the CIA. And one of these was the Foundation for Youth and Student Affairs that I've already uh, mentioned, as indeed were most of uh, the foundations that seemed to fund international activity at that time. Now, it seems kind of counterproductive that you say, well, the, the ISC is generally um, coming to what you might call left-wing conclusions. So why are the CIA funding them? Well, they're funding them so that they can make sure and keep tabs on um, what is happening. One of the tactics that was used quite often was that um, if um, somebody who was an agent and CIA agents were present at these meetings, as were KGB agents uh, present at IUS meetings, um, if they saw people were particularly getting on, they would join a conversation and deliberately sow discord so that people didn't, you know, they, they, they broke up the meeting and so on. Um, this tactic is described in a book called Patriotic Betrayal by a woman called Karen Paget. Now, she describes um, the situation at the age of 19. Imagine this. She, um, her, her and her husband, who was on the United States NSA executive, she worked for them as a secretary. Um, were bundled into a car at midnight, driven to a place they knew not where, um, an undisclosed location, um, briefed by the CIA on where their funds were coming from, and then told that they will be um, put in prison for treason 
if they ever revealed where the funds came from. Now, actually, the, the laws change, and so she's been able to reveal that story. But you know, imagine that's a really frightening thing to be happening um, at that time um, of your life. So this um, led to difficulties within the ISC because people were horrified by what had happened. I mean, it wasn't surprising that were being funded, but in the zeitgeist of the times, many students were more disappointed by the revelation about the ISC. And they demanded to know where funds had come from and what, if any, strings were attached. Um, and then you've got this, the next picture is the Prague Spring, which brutally crushed by the USSR. And the, so the, again, the failure by this um, caused a rift within a number of national unions, and it caused a number of national unions to leave the IUS, uh, for example. Um, so Jan Palach, who was um, a, a student pictured here, he burned himself to death outside um, Charles Hughes University and became a symbol of resistance uh, against authority to many students. And you can still see his memorial today, which I've shown there in the picture at the university end of Charles Bridge, um, if you ever visit Prague. So those hopeful days, I guess, of um, giving birth to the organizations and the genuine efforts by founders to create a true student international were soon a distant memory. So those people who'd met and had fun in the Hostel in 1945, uh, we're now either side of a divided world, and there must be many regrets for uh, work that didn't, wasn't allowed to flourish. So any illusion that the IUS white work as a truly international forum had disappeared by 1948 and by 1950, the ISC, which had been created to work outside what was seen as a partisan bloc, had itself become compromised as a, a partisan organisation. So in a sense, yeah, any idea of student union, um, student unity um, disappeared. So we'll just take a, a, a quick pause there because it's in this period of time, the next period of time, that so some of the NUS is, I mean, the ISC collapses and, and doesn't exist anymore. Um, the funding disappears um, because people don't want the funding. Um, so this is where you start to get other more localized organizations, clusters of international um, student organizations. So this is when OPLI emerges in, I think in 1966 and all African student union somewhat later you get WESIB and so on. Um, and so they, the collapse had different impacts in different parts, but interestingly, within the UK, the collapse of the ISC destroyed the credibility of the then student leadership of NUS, and then it took, so the NUS then took a more left um, approach uh, to politics, and they got rid of their stu students as such clause as well, so they could discuss things in a more um, broad social context. <laughs> So um, I'll just quickly pause there to see if there are any questions or comments that people wish to make. There is one in the chat. Hi. Mark, your hand is raised. Go, Bismarck. I'm sorry, Bismarck, you're breaking out quite significantly. <laughs> That, that's not me. Uh, I, I wanted to speak up, but I heard someone speak. Please go ahead. Okay, all right. Uh, so uh, whilst we we're speaking, a number of things uh, came up. For instance, at the first um, IUS Congress, where you mentioned that they had, uh, they're going to do the election of the president. I wanted to know, so they had a constitution already? Yes, they did. And then they had uh, like a, a governing structure in there? Yes. And so I want to know, was there like, a, how, how was the representation? Did it take into consideration like the regions of the world, uh, which people are coming from the Asian region, the African region, the Western Europe and all that? Did you have that kind of consideration? And then what was the involvement of uh, African students at that stage? I know later you started mentioning the African region around the 1950s, but at, at that level, were they African students, especially when you first spoke about the, the meeting in uh, Russia also, were the African students involved? When you mentioned the meetings in London, were they African students involved or was it a westernized kind of meeting at, the, at that stage or to, it, 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 it evolved? Okay, I'll, I'll answer it in reverse. So in terms of creating the constitution, um, establishing the forum of the IUS, I don't think African students were very much involved in that process. However, um, what was available was funds to travel. So um, the, and certainly the, the funding organizations, so USSR, but also the Czech government, uh, East German government and so on, they would fund and sponsor students to attend. So a lot of 
African delegates get there because they're sponsored and funded and their flights are covered. Uh, because there was a genuine desire to have everybody in the room, yeah, to say, you know, because you, you didn't, because the CIE was never really as credible as an international organization because it didn't involve everybody. Whereas the IOS and certainly IRC meetings involved a lot more people. So, so there was certainly that. I don't know what the delegation makeup was, but the constitution was agreed Constitution agreed at the meetings in 1945, the one in London and the one in Prague, and then you have the, the first kickoff meeting, if you like, uh, in 1946. And what's also interesting is, I, I suppose, that the, the credentials committee, so this was the committee that decided who was a legitimate representative or who was not. So they decided which organization could come. Now, I may get my names wrong here, but there was an organization called the um, All Indian Student Federation, which I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, was broadly communist based. And then there was a, another organization in India called the Indian National Union of Students. Plus, of course, there were lots of other um, Indian student organizations that were linked to their political parties. The only organization that was given the representation for India was the All India Student Federation, the communist one. And this pattern is repeated um particularly amongst the emerging states if you like the, the states fighting for liberation and often that's because the communists are the only people supporting them in their liberation so that's, that's partially why that's happening and people have come to their own conclusions about you know creating a different world and a different society so um i don't know exactly the numbers of representations or but i do know that quite a number of countries were present and certainly a number of african countries were present at that initial IOS meeting. Is there any other my, 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 question? My last question. Um, sure. you, you, you spoke about the, um, how do I put it? What they were supposed to discuss. Did I hear you say they had a clause that, that restricted them to discuss strictly student activity? Yes, you heard correctly. And that, that's been, um, attention of a number of international student organizations. Do we discuss politics? Do we not? And it's very hard not to in many ways. Um, so as I said, my own national union, and you know, England and Wales at this time had a, what they called a students as such clause, and they were very committed to it. And they thought that when they lost that clause, they would lose credibility with decision makers and everything else. That didn't happen. Um, so, but there was that, there's always been that tension. Of, do we just discuss what we want to discuss as students? Do we discuss broader social issues and what's going on in the world, which has an impact on us as students? Um, to give you an example, there was um, one of our future trade union leaders when he was a student. He brought a motion to his student union, University College of London, um, condemning um, nuclear testing on Pacific Islands. And this was ruled out of order because it didn't involve students. So he brought it to the next meeting and said he condemned nuclear testing on Pacific islands, which had an impact on the lives of students. And he listed all the effects of students. And that was allowed because it was about students. So there was a, yeah, so people would find ways around it. Um, but as you can see, it was a point of tension. It was about priorities in many ways. Do we discuss lots of things or just this? Okay. But my question then is what was considered student issue? What was it? What is that? Well, I, I would imagine purely th purely things related to the student experience. So things like what is going on in the institution, higher education, probably accommodation, and anything with, about student life. Yes. So, um, so if, again, if I use UK as an example, I protest that. But you know, for example, in 1968, we have lots of demonstrations about the Vietnam War, for example. Um, but our leadership at that time is saying, don't get involved in these. Um, demonstrations. It's nothing to do with students. You know, it's just other people using an, an issue. You know, um, when NUS dropped its no politics clause in 1969, it was able to discuss the Vietnam War implications. Does that make sense? That's the sort yeah. of difference. Yeah. Anyway, I better, I better crack on um, because um, time runs out, and I don't want to overrun. So, hold on. so next up, if I can get this to move. There we go. So I'm going to show you um, another clip now. So having, um, so we, we, we've reached 1968, so 67, we have the Ramparts um, issue revealing about the ISC. In 1968, you've got the um, 
Prague Spring. But of course, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in 1968 and what they call the long 60s. Um, so sort of mid 60s, really are leaking into the 70s of student revolt over a whole range of issues. Um, so here's just one. This is some scenes from Paris. Paris, the worst street fighting in the French capital since the liberation in 1944. Students and police clashed as the youngsters demonstrated against the closing of the Sorbonne University, following extremist political action against the war in Vietnam. Trouble fled between opposing student factions. The authorities clamped down hard. The students retaliated by demonstrating against any form of authority. Riots flared throughout the night as rampaging students declared their violent scorn of the establishment. And in daylight, riot police were equally keen to show that they intended to restore law and order. The clashes were ugly and bloody. One victim who painfully discovered that violence is often met with violence. On the road. Yeah. So there we go. So that was just um, one of many situations um, globally um, that was taking place. There were student demonstrations in Mexico and Japan, in London, Paris, various parts of the United States and South Africa, Northern Ireland with the civil rights movement there. Um, and a lot of them, you know, uh, resulted in the, the death of students or the imprisonment of students, um, injury of students. Um, and it was, but equally, it was different groups of students taking inspiration about different issues. So the, the whole French um, student revolt, I think, starts around accommodation and the lack of accommodation for students, but it grows and it grows into a wider um, social movement. Um, and it had a profound effect on student organizations that started to take a more separate line from their parent government, um, if, you, if you want a, a better word. And what starts to happen is because um, the international student organizations have, have to some extent been compromised. Um, Paris. Um, here are some just general images globally um, from the student revolt. Because some of these um, organizations have been compromised, a lot of NUSs start to have bilateral meetings, um, smaller meetings to get to know each other a little bit better away from um, some of the tensions of membership and funding and, and, and everything else. Um, so this is just um, some images from um, this sort of work, some of them from the UK, some of them not. Um, but the there's constant attempts to try and bring people together. Here you've got um, Martin Luther King addressing British students at one of their conferences and so on. And again, because they've dropped the no politics clause, there's more of a chance to then condemn what is going on um, or to support civil rights movement in the United States. Um, Chile, for example, um, one of our executive members from UK um, entered Chile um, after the, uh, the coup, the military coup by Pinochet, um, collected information, came back to the UK and shared the information and the statements from uh, Chilean students as to what was happening to them under that uh, regime. There was a lot of work done by organizations across the world around apartheid um, and trying to dismantle um, that regime. The poster there, of the, the Berkeley Bank one was a satirical poster that was persuading students not to um, bank with, this or, with the organization. And in fact, it was that poster that was the trigger for Barclays to withdraw their funding uh, from the South African regime. Um, so we then start to get um, different organizations emerging. Here is um, Oklai, um, and I know we have colleagues present there today. So as far as I know, founded in 1966 um, at the fourth Latin American Congress of Students, which was at, at that point hosted by uh, Cuba and Cuba today provides the headquarters for the organization. So which I think consists of 36 NUSs from 23 countries. And if I'm reading that website right, it may have changed. So apologies if it does. But the sort of word that I have been involved with is um, standing against neoliberalism, um, what you might call educational imperialism from the United States, colonialism, and for social justice, and for social justice and broad democratic fronts. So you start to, it, it's a lot easier to discuss things um, in a regional context uh, without having to travel as globally as some of the international organizations do. Um, this is, this next slide here is um, from the, from about some of the European meetings um, that took place. Um, 
there was a European meeting that used to take place quite regularly, but again, those Cold War tensions were still there. Um, and they always tried to agree a communique at the end, but also the, there were really tortuous meetings that went on late, late, late into the night, even later than some European oh. Student Union Conference uh, Congress um, meetings take place. Um, but I'm, this is um, quite a long clip, but um, students globally are often considered to be part of their youth movements. And this, um, this is the World Federation of Democratic Youth, which is, again, funded primarily by the USSR and particularly East Germany in this case. Um, but it's invited students from all over the world and they're there present. Um, and as you can see, it's quite a big affair. So there's, there's, there's quite a few things here that show some of the politics that was going on, but also some of the cultural stuff that was going on. So let's take a quick look at this one. <laughs> Tens of thousands, by signing these sheets of glass, demonstrated their solidarity with all those fighting against imperialism. In the Solidarity Center, Erich Honecker met Vo Thi Lien, the only survivor of the U.S. massacre at My Lai. <laughs> Das Volk von Vietnam hatte jetzt fast 30 Jahre Krieg und jeden Tag erholten sie vom Himmel ein Stück Sieg und jeden Tag gibt das Volk ein Teil von seiner Kraft, doch sie haben es geschafft. There was always something on in the Solidarity Center. Young people from Vietnam with friends from Latin America. They too have a mutual enemy, young Palestinians driven from their homes into miserable refugee camps by Israel with the support of imperialism, and the young people of Chile, united in the Unidad Popular, defying domestic and foreign reactionaries. Mike Barron of the British delegation hands to the Vietnamese a cheque for £2,500. The Secretary General of the Finnish Committee for Solidarity with Vietnam presented the delegation from Southeast Asia with $300,000. These are only two examples from the flood of practical proofs of solidarity. Solidarity with the peoples, the youth and students of Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia. Now more than ever was the slogan of this day, which ended with the great mass meeting. The cheers were for the heroes of the liberation struggle, who had proved so dramatically that imperialism could no longer enforce the motives of the free German youth, which has nearly two million members. They demonstrated that the young generation were working to fulfill the great human task of socialism, side by side with their parents and in the spirit of all pioneers of peace and social progress.
here once again friendship was taboo. Everyone could put his viewpoint. Some doubters from capitalist countries had to do some rethinking after experiencing Alexanderplatz in Berlin. More than 1,000 separate performances gave a taste of culture and art all over the world. Okay, so you, you get you get the idea. Um, so those those meetings of the uh, World Federation of Democratic Youth, and then there was later a similar conference in 1978 at Cuba. Um, very well attended, very big events. But certainly, I know if you take the UK delegation at the time that was there, they were incredibly politically divided. Some very much in favour of what was going on, some very much hostile to what was going on. And there was that, so it was not a forum, if you like, for bringing people together necessarily. It reinforced some of the, again, Cold World divisions that were um, taking place at the time. For example, in, within the British delegation of that, of the one in, that was held in Berlin, that um, the, one of the, one of our delegates um, for that, one of those, one of those marches that you saw going through the streets um, was having, a, wanted a gay liberation uh, banner uh, to, to take place. And one of our other delegates um, um, assaulted him and said that he couldn't take the banner. And the East German authorities intervened and said, it's okay, there are no gay people in East Germany. Um, so we don't need that banner. So, so again, tensions that um, were difficult <laughs> were experienced of these things. So again, people are looking to more um, regional um, cooperation. So again, now in 72, we get the creation of All Africa Students Union. I, I, know, I noticed that Peter is present here. Here I have pictures of Peter also um, with uh, the, the eighth um, African Summit of Youth and Students. But again, an organization that um, looks to exchange information and capacity building in particular, um, but supporting liberation um, struggles historically um, over the years. And so currently, ASTU ha now has, I think, 54 member countries that really focus on advocacy, networking, partnership, and capacity development. But within that, looking at democracy and good governance, gender rights, pan-Africanism, migration, mobility, environmental action, and student rights. And then the sort of one of the next bricks is uh, the European Students' Union, um, which I first came across is a picture of me in the middle there, looking um, obviously just as young as I ever did, um, uh, from evolved from the Western European Students Information Bureau to S2. So um, apparently, I think today, 17th of October is um, WESIB's, but WESIB was founded on this very day. Um, so it's kind of SU's birthday today that we should um, acknowledge. It was established at a meeting in Stockholm in 1982. And the main objective was to exchange information about student welfare and education matters and not to get involved in taking a position on anything, although anything was allowed to be discussed um, at these meetings. Um, they avoided problems with the IUS, who were kind of hostile to the idea initially um, by not presuming pursuing a partisan agenda um, at all. So the first director um, of the organization was a guy called Bjorn Sundstrom, you can see there in the, the black and white picture. And then the next two directors, there's Brian Carty, who's the left of me in the gray shirt there. And then the third director was um, 
uh, Sarah Adams, who was uh, also from UK, Brian Carty was from Ireland, um, and represent, represented actually the Irish school students um, at the time. And then of course you've got Martina, who's the current um, um, ESU um, president. And then you've got um, Zamzam, who's one of the vice presidents currently. And then that picture down below is a meeting of alumni of the organization. And again, the alumni are often play a great role in sustaining um, and supporting the organization. Um, but in around about 1988, um, West Seabot moved its office from London, where it used to be, to Vienna. And that was actually a very fortuitous move uh, because that placed it at the center of Europe at the time when the Berlin Wall was coming down and lots of new or adapted or evolved student organizations were emerging uh, from the former Warsaw Pact um, countries. And certainly that picture was taken with me there. We, we were very much involved in um, helping and supporting and helping that transition um, to take place um, at the time. Um, so eventually WESIB dropped the W, it became an ESIB, it became a European Student Information Bureau. And it was really with the creation of the Bologna process and student mobility and a need to be represented. So they didn't start off with a desire to represent, a need to represent evolved and eventually was taken up uh, by the, what was now, or was in 2007 created as the European um, Students Association. And the final sort of global brick, I suppose, is the Commonwealth Students Association, which was launched in uh, 2012, I think, uh, I mean, see, uh, uh, at a conference of Commonwealth education ministers, I think was in Mauritius. In fact, that picture, that picture there, you can see of the group of people um, on the right hand side um, is from that particular conference, I think, as the initial steering group. And the aims of the CSA were to promote unity among students in Commonwealth countries, protect the rights of students in those countries and create an environment to build um, capacity and cooperate. And one of the initial things that they uh, did uh, was to commission a report on the state of student government in Commonwealth countries, uh, which I, was a project I was involved with. But what it did was analyze all the countries that were members of Commonwealth and what was the state of their student representation um, there. And that report was accepted um, at a CCM meeting in the Bahamas in 2015. Uh, interesting enough, once I I went in to present the report to the ministers. Um, I presented to the student organisations, I presented to the youth organisations, I presented to the civil servants, and then I had to go to the ministers to present it. Um, and the, the guy helping me, Lane from Trinidad, said, don't forget, some of the people around that table you're about to speak to came to power through student revolution and they don't want it to happen again. So, you know, you had to be very diplomatic and careful um, in um, what it was said, I suppose. Um, but one of the things that the student governance report led to was then to develop a capacity building toolkit to, and it was kind of low tech, how to set up a national union from scratch, because a number of um, Commonwealth based organisations didn't have a national union as such. They had lots of student organisations, but again, they were more aligned to their political parties rather than having a, a unified whole. Um, so um, I'll, I'll show you quick I'll show you this final video, but we've got um, one of the delegates to basically there was a capacity building event that was held in Kenya that was attended by five different NUSs from Tanzania, uh, from Uganda. Um, and here we go. So this is one of the delegates saying the experience that she had. Angeline Koyo from Karatina University. I'm a fourth year student. I pursue information science. I'm a deputy secretary general to the student governing council there. The different speakers have given different approaches to leadership. That gives me a broader view on how to tackle my leadership back at school and even out, outside school because the leadership was not only limited to your jurisdiction, that is your school but also exercising the skills that you got to our immediate environment. Then from that point... Sorry. That's when you can, you can experience, you can, you can extend it to the... Uh, All right, I'll, I'll wind it on a project. At large. My most favorite session was from uh, the, the lady student leader from the University of Nairobi. I love her courage. It's, it's very, not weird per se, but it's very, it's very difficult or hard for you to find some, a, a lady to be specific 
who, who is a go-getter go and would go for whatever she believes is right, independent of the challenges they experience. Most of the ladies give up along the way. If they go and get stuff, you'd only find the gentlemen spearheading whatever they began. But that was a very good icon to emulate. Yeah, that was very striking. Ah, the debate was okay. It was on point now that uh, I was on the winning side. <laughs> yeah, I just have to acknowledge that. Yeah, the debating was okay. It gave us very uh, different aspects from different types of leaders, different countries. Being able to articulate that so that even as we come up with the national student organization in Kenya, we are able to look at look at it from different points of view. That that was, the debate was awesome. Bearing that we had different ideologies from different people and different citizens. Okay, uh, I would just like to say thank you to the Commonwealth, Commonwealth Organization for organizing such uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant forum that brings together international students. And it's my, it's my, it's my desire that whatever we've talked about be implemented. Which now in Kenya, whatever we are facing, is we, we have brilliant ideas, we have the best of ideas, but the implementation of these ideas Thank you, Commonwealth Students Association. You're so grateful. Thank you. Okay, so now we get to the, the final um, bit, um, which is the road to the Global um, Student Forum. So obviously we, we've got the growing power and credibility and legitimacy of the sort of the regional uh, blocks, if you will, uh, which I've just described to you. Um, and again, you know, obviously attending global meetings is still expensive, but I guess with, with Zoom and all the technology we're using today, it has suddenly become a lot easier. And of course, it is a lot easier to actually have an umbrella group for umbrella groups, if, if you saw what I mean, um, rather than going for the mass delegation um, approaches that were tried in the past. Um, so if we start off with... Um, so this road kind of starts back in 2012 when NUS UK was 90 and it decided to seek funding, which was also problematic, um, to seek funding for a, a global student conference um, in 2012, partially to reconnect with its international mission. That was the idea behind it. Um, and the idea was, so what it would do was agree a final communique and what they wanted to do was discuss issue, student issues around student social justice, education, climate action, and peace. And a, and a final communication was agreed um, on that. However, it was a bit of a false start in terms of um, any kind of global student unity. Number one, um, a number of African leaders, student leaders, did not get the visa to come. So they were not as well represented as it was hoped they would be or should be. And actually the sponsorship caused a problem for a lot of colleagues in South American countries, particularly Santander Bank. So that was not seen as an appropriate um, source of funding for it. So there was not much attendance from that part of the world. Um, but it, what it did do was start the idea amongst people and really learning from their mistakes, I guess. Um, and that leads to the next stage, which is the Berglund Declaration. So in between the 2012 conference, there was a group called the International um, Student, um, yeah, the International Student Working Group, International Cooperation Student Working Group, um, uh, which was set up by ESU. So I, I, I was a member of that committee. And the idea of that was to at least get to Bergen some representatives of other parts of the world to start the process of cooperation. And that was done Interestingly, that you know, the membership, and it will be no surprise, really, membership was Spain and France and UK. So th these are all countries that formerly had empires, but as a consequence of that, had contact with student organisations in different parts of the world. Um, I mean, I've talked about a lot of the um, sort of British former empire links. I mean, those exist in, in the French-speaking world and Spanish-speaking world and so on. Um, so that was the idea to get people together and so sufficient representatives were there and they agreed um, the um, Berglund Declaration, um, which again looked at, um, yeah, anyway, just lost my notes there. So basically the terms of reference for the organization, uh, sorry, yeah, 
So it was about education being a right, and it looked at education as a public good. It looked at access to education, particularly for women. It looked at sustainability, mobility, and safety. Um, and it, it made a commitment to try and create a more formalized uh, student voice. And at this point, people are still thinking about organizations possibly, but really, um, I think people are thinking that an umbrella group of umbrella groups is a, is a better way uh, to go. Then um, we, we, finally, we finally arrive at where we are um, today. So, so basically the leaders of the organizations of ASU, CSA, OCLI, ASU, and OBESO actually, um, have met regularly um, during 2018. They've um, attended different conferences and they either attended special meetings um, with each other or they rode off the back of other conferences in which student input was being um, entertained. And so that, that has led to a lot of really careful negotiation and discussion, which um, Sebastian and Carmen can tell you far more um, than, I, than I can. Um, but in terms of, it, I mean, the sorts of things that um, the Global Students Forum is highlighting, has highlighted and will highlight is the rise in tuition fees and the commodification of higher education systems, climate change and imminent climate catastrophe, the rise of authoritarianism, we experienced that in the 30s, it seems to be um, on the rise again, and erosion of democracy and democratic values. Um, so to formalize the cooperation with Global Student Forum, each of the regional student federations adopted a letter of intent to support the Global Student Forum. Various fundraisers, but the main funders have been the Odin Open Society Foundation, um, which has funded a lot of the initial activity and indeed hosts the Secretariat, which is um, currently based in Brussels. Um, so really, um, with the Global Student Forum about to embark upon a journey, um, having meetings like this, taking up campaigns that you can see um, it's described to you on, on, the, on the screen, you know, that this is now the next stage, and I guess, how it develops, what it does, how it cooperates with each other is down to you, uh, the leaders who are, are present here today. So I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand you back to Carmen, who will encourage you to do some quick group discussion and then we'll come together as a final group and finish. Okay, so Carmen, if I could hand back to you. Yes, thanks a lot, Mike. It was really insightful. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. I hope the rest uh, enjoy as well. Um, so now we're going to move for uh, 10, 15 minutes um, to, to the sessions within the groups. Uh, I'm going to assign you automatically, so it's going to be randomized. Um, I have some guiding questions for you uh, related to the session. I don't know, Mike, if you also want to introduce any other question. Um, Let me say, I, I thought I had yeah. it on that slide, but uh, I so. bear with me, bear with me, and I'll, um, I think I've got it on the slide, but if I haven't, I apologize. Uh, it's okay, I, otherwise I have them here. Here we are, I have the questions, I have the questions, okay. so I stopped sharing too soon. There you go. There. Yeah, so this, uh, you have these three questions. Uh, what was new or surprising for you to learn about the student movement? Which lessons can we draw from the past looking into the future? And are there any interesting facts about the history of the student movement you want to be to share with colleagues? Um, I'm going to divide you, as I said, in the, um, in the rooms, in the breakout rooms, so you can discuss, discuss these questions. And, and then we will come back. And if you have um, any comments that you want to share with Mike or any questions that you would like to ask, then also we will also have time for that. One moment, I'm assigning everyone. 